everyone. Welcome back to um, another live stream. We've got, a, I think, what's going to be a really cool presentation today by Eli and Lindsay, um, talking all about the scale and wonders of the universe. Um, before I turn it over to them, just for anyone new, we'll do some quick introductions. Um, I am Jessica. I am the Planetarium Director. Um, and then let's go with Lindsay. Say hi. Uh, I'm Lindsay. I'm a physics graduate student at UMD. Um, I'm Eli. I'm a physics undergraduate student at UMD. Awesome. So, um, I will turn it over to you two since you're running the show. Um, if you have any questions throughout, uh, write them down in the comments. I will be watching that so that I can let them know if you have any questions. Um, just keep in mind that there is a little bit of lag between when we see them and when you hear the answer. So give it a few minutes. Um, anything that we don't get to, we will take a few minutes at the end uh, to answer any of those questions that we don't get to right away. So. So um, I will let you guys take it over. Okay, so I'm going to quick figure out the screen sharing and turn my camera on. Then this should work. Okay, are we looking good there? Yep. Okay, sweet. So um, kind of an, another augmented title. Also, Lindsay should be in the uh, name there. We didn't uh, have a ton of time to throw that stuff in there. But yes, um, this will be Lindsay and I. Um, this presentation is going to start off with um, kind of giving an idea of how big everything is and how far away everything is, because it's something that never ceases to amaze me. Um, and I hope it is the same situation for you. So um, I want to start small um, with kind of the smallest measurable thing. Um, that we can talk about, which would be a proton. Um, protons are subatomic particles. They're found in the nuclei of atoms. Um, they give positive charge uh, to those atoms, which is counteracted by electrons with their uh, negative charge. Um, and the diameter of a proton, which is kind of the smallest measurable thing, we can estimate it for electrons and smaller things, but we don't have a great degree of certainty, um, is 1 times 10 to the negative 15 meters, which is... Um, point 15 zeros and then a one so extremely small um and we'll give some context for how small that is um so if we were to take the head of a pin 5.3 times 10 to the 17 protons lined up so five three 17 zeros after it as you see right there protons lined up next to each other would span across the tip of a needle um this is already kind of mind boggling to me to think that there, you know, we look at something so simple um, and think that there's so much that goes into it. Um, I don't know. It's, it's always crazy for me to think about stuff like this, um, but we can continue on to the next slide. Um, and we'll talk about the constituents of these. Um, protons are built of um, these things called quarks. Um, a proton has two up quarks and a down quark. Um, and, you know, that's I'm not going to get into that because I don't know a ton about that either, but um, I know um, that they're extremely small. And um, even though it is hard to measure them, uh, we believe they're about 1 times 10 to the negative 18th meters. So um, 0.18 zeros and then 1. Um, and then electrons, um, which uh, as far as we know, don't have smaller constituents, are also um, extremely hard to measure the size of. And rather than giving a number for the size, we say that they exist in these um, orbital clouds around an atom. So as we can see here, it's not like it's actually a particle that is orbiting this nucleus uh, in these specific rings like moons going around a planet, but rather they exist with some probability inside of this sphere around the um, around the atom and different energy levels of electrons will exist in different spheres. Um, the uh, more energized the electron is, the farther away from the nucleus it's going to be. And then if it would get energized enough, it would evaporate from the nucleus. And then there would be no probability of it being there. But um, since we can't really measure them um, or know where they are at a certain time or where they're going, um, we say that they exist in this uh, probability sphere around the uh, nucleus of an atom. Um, so just to give some scale for how big an atom is, take a football stadium like the U.S. Bank Stadium and then place a P in the center of the stadium. 
the P would be the nucleus of the atom, which is where all the neutrons and protons are. And then the rest of the stadium, which is empty space, um, would have electrons floating in, which are these, you know, like I said, almost, you know, undetectably small particles that are orbiting. So most of an atom is empty space. Um, and I think that's just kind of a staggering comparison um, to be made there. Um, so now we'll talk about life, um, life built of atoms. Um, uh, and uh, they're made of these these molecules that are made of constituent atoms. Um, the smallest viruses, which is kind of the smallest life that we know of, um, are in the range of 20 to 400 um, nanometers, 10 to the ninth meters, um, which are extremely small. Um, these This uh, bacteriophage right here, the top image, um, that is what is really that small. And those attach onto cells and eject RNA in there. Um, but that's biology. That's not um, physics or astronomy. Um, and then uh, E. coli bacteria, which is the bottom video, uh, it is reproducing down there, is two times 10 to the negative six meters, um, which is uh, another staggering number because we think about how many of those would fit you know, on your hand. It's kind of terrifying, actually. Um, and uh, two billion protons lined up tip to tail would be as long as one E. coli bacterium, which is, again, pretty amazing. Um, so now we will go to some bigger life. Um, the height of the average human male is 1.75 meters tall, which would be 875,000 E. coli bacteria tip to tail, um, which would be 1.75 times 10 to the 15th protons lined up. So 175 with 15 zeros after it, um, protons lined up would be as tall as a human. Um, and then the largest known animal, which is the blue whale, is 33 meters long, which is 19 human males stacked up. So 19 times 1.75 times 10 to the 15th would be how many protons would um, line up to make a blue whale, which is, we're getting into like numbers that I don't know the names of. Um, I believe that would be somewhere in the quadrillions place, um, but I'm not going to try because I'd make a fool of myself. Um, so next we have the biggest of human creation, which would be the Burj Khalifa, um, which is the tallest tower. Um, and it is 829.8 meters tall, which would be 25 blue whales, which would turn into, um, about 478 human males and, um, 4.18 times 10 to the eighth, uh, E. coli bacteria lined up, um, which is also kind of amazing. Um, and then after that, um, we have the biggest thing on earth. I mean, kind of, um, there are bigger trenches under the ocean, but we know Mount Everest um, to be 8,848 meters tall. Um, and I stopped displaying the numbers on the screen so it doesn't turn into a cluster of zeros. Um, that would be 10 and a half Burj Khalifas stacked tip to tail, um, which would be 264 blue whales and 5,000 and about 18 human males standing on each other's heads. Um, going up that would reach the top of Mount Everest. So now uh, we'll talk about Earth itself. Um, the diameter of Earth is uh, 7,917 and a half miles, um, which uh, there are the conversions down there that turns into um, 12,741,981 meters um, right there. Um, this would be um, 1,440 Mount Everest stacked on top of each other, which would turn into 15,121 Burj Khalifas and 380,294 blue whales tip to tail across to uh, span that diameter. Um, so now we'll get into some real astronomical numbers. Um, the Earth to the moon. Um, it is uh, 238,855 miles between the Earth and the moon on average. It changes a little bit here and there. Um, but on average, it is that far, which would be 31 Earths. So if you were to stack Earth next to each other 31 times, it would reach to the moon. Um, and this translates to uh, 44,640 Mount Everests stacked on top of each other, which um, translate. this is kind of a funny number to me, um, 400, 400,000 or 468,000 rather, 720 Burj Khalifa. So that tower stacked together or almost 500,000 times um, would reach to the moon. Um, and another thing that's really interesting to me about this distance is that um, all planets could fit in between the Earth and the Moon, which seems kind of ridiculous, but um, they could all fit in there, which is pretty cool. Um, so next we'll talk about the solar system. And this one has also some staggering numbers. I think I might skip over some because um, it is a lot. But um, the distance from Mercury to the Sun is 35.98 million miles 
which would be um, 151 times the distance of the Earth to the moon, which translates to 4,670 Earths. So, you know, 4,670 Earths right next to each other would span that distance. And then um, it just uh, increases uh, with each planet. So Venus to the sun is about half as or twice as far as um, Mercury to the sun. Um, Earth to the sun um, is 92.96 million miles, um, so about one and a half times the uh, distance from Venus to the sun. Um, that would translate to 12,000 Earths about stacked next to each other. And then as we go out, it really turns into some ridiculous numbers. Um, the distance from Neptune to the sun is 2.793 billion miles, um, which would be 362,491 Earths stacked next to each other. Um, and you can see it kind of starts to get into some ridiculous numbers here. So um, now that we're talking on scales this big, we have to talk about different units. Uh, miles and Earths aren't really an acceptable unit of distance anymore. Um, so light speed is the speed that, you know, electromagnetic waves propagate at or, you know, light leaves your light bulb at, um, which is 300,000 uh, meters per second or uh, 670 mil or yeah, 670 million miles per hour. Um, and that is really staggering. Um, we think of it to be instantaneous when we turn a light on or something like that, but that's just because our eyes can't really make up the difference when it's traveling that fast. But at that speed, it takes eight minutes for light to get from the sun to the earth, um, which is uh, translates to about four hours from the sun to Neptune, um, which is kind of insane to think about. We know light to be almost instantaneous, like I said, when it leaves our light bulbs, but um, to get from the sun to Neptune is four hours, uh, which is kind of amazing. Um, so then we get a new unit of distance, which is the light year. Um, how far light travels in a year? It is, um, I mean, there's the conversion there. If you were to take 300,000 meters per second uh, times 60 seconds per minute times 60 minutes per hour times 24 hours a day times about 365 days in a year, um, we end up getting um, just about nine and a half um, quadrillion meters. Um, so that's how far our light year is. It's a it, staggering number um and uh that's why we kind of have to do this because i can't keep on rattling off quadrillions of meters um or hundreds of thousands of earths so now we will talk about uh nebulae um nebulae are these massive uh, stellar nursery um graveyards that uh, kind of act as you know the limbo of stars uh, when they die they release all this gas and all this material and then that gas and material conglomerates into new stars. And this process takes a long time and I'm grossly oversimplifying it, but um, they're very beautiful. Um, and if you get the chance to see one through a telescope, you're extremely lucky. Um, and in, on average, they vary in size a lot, but on average, they're just under a light year in diameter, um, which translates to about 600 solar systems stacked next to each other. So these things are huge. Um, the interesting thing is, is that they're super thin. There's like almost nothing there. Um, but when we see it from far away, this gas that's in there, this small amount of gas gets illuminated by the stars inside and they turn into these spectacular light shows. Um, so that is a nebula. Um, now I'll talk about the nearest star, which is Proxima Centauri. Um, it is 4.12 uh, light years away. Again, this means it takes 4.12 years from light to come from that star to us. Um, so uh, that would be, um, just one quick conversion. So 264,630 times the distance from the sun to the earth would span the distance from earth or the sun to Proxima Centauri, which is again, amazing. And it's extremely far away and kind of hard to comprehend, but that's, you know, inches compared to what is really out there. So next we will talk about the Milky Way, um, and it's about 100,000 light years in diameter. Although I recently heard um, or read an article that they are starting to find kind of almost imperceptible boundaries of orbiting stuff that's much further, but definite. Um, we have about 100,000 light years, um, which means that, again, it would take 100,000 uh, years for light to travel from one end to the other. Um, and the span of this distance is um, 25,000 times the distance from the sun to that nearest star, Proxima Centauri, which would translate to 6.5 billion times the distance from the sun to the Earth, um, which is amazing. Um, and then we have a supermassive black hole at the center, which was um, just recently confirmed, I believe last year, somewhere around September. Um, and it is 27.5 million miles uh, in diameter, which is just shy of the distance from Mercury to the sun. Um, so it's actually, you know, 
for all intents and purposes. Not that large, but it's extremely massive and its gravitational effects are, are quite amazing. Um, and it's about 4 million times the mass of the sun. So that's a lot of weight uh, crushed into a very small area. Um, so now we will talk about the nearest galaxy um, or the nearest you know, kind of full galaxy, which is the Andromeda galaxy. Um, it's 2.5 million light years away, which is um, if you were to stack the Milky Way up tip to tail 25 times, that's about how far away it would be, um, which turns into 625,000 times the distance from the sun to the nearest star. Um, another interesting fact about this is that in about 4 billion years, just over, just shy of, um, our galaxies are actually going to collide. So despite the immense distance between them, um, their masses are pulling each other together with gravity. And uh, for a period of time, uh, we will have a full galaxy in our nighttime sky. Now, I don't think I'm going to make it that far, but um, I wish I could because that would be a pretty fantastic thing to see. Um, Next, we'll talk about the local group. Um, so the local group is kind of this area of space that um, encompasses our closest neighbor galaxies. Um, and uh, there are, it's about 10 million light years in diameter, um, which is uh, about 125 Milky Ways uh, lined up tip to tail. Um, and the distance from the Milky Way to that nearest Andromeda galaxy is about one fourth of the size of it. Um, and those are the two largest galaxies uh, in the group. A lot of them are much smaller dwarf galaxies, um, but this is really an amazing, amazing volume. I mean, most of it is empty because it's just the interstellar media or the intergalactic medium, but um, it's uh, pretty overwhelming to think about how big this is. Not as overwhelming though, as the Virgo supercluster. Um, now our local group is a group in the supercluster, and it kind of it's like a Matryoshka doll from here on out. There are just these bigger, bigger um, units of volume or you know structures that have galaxies in them. Um, and we can see that there is kind of this like spider web, like there's this distribution that kind of takes these random patterns. Um, and uh, the space in between them are the voids, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, but it's about 110 uh, million light years in diameter, and it is part of the line. Kea supercluster. Um, so the Virgo supercluster is just one of these uh, little white dots in the Lania Kea supercluster, which is um, also immense and kind of numbers too big to talk about, but it's kind of this over encompassing structure that has all of these clusters in it. Um, so uh, now we'll look at the observable universe. Um, there's a lot more universe out there, we think. We don't know because um, we can't see it. Um, our observable universe is the limits of what we can see because light has not had time to reach us from outside of there in the time that the universe has been um, in existence. Um, and it's 27.54 billion light years across. Um, and it started with the Big Bang, started expanding outwards. Um, and like I said, we can only see um, how far light has had time to travel to us. So it's growing every second, um, but you know this is a really immense scale. So it never fails to boggle my mind. Um, so now we'll talk about some of the interesting things that are out there. I suppose this would be more of the wonders part of the presentation. Um, so my favorite thing I think is neutron stars. Um, so we always talk about you know the ubiquitous black hole that is kind of the uh, the coup de gras of um, wondrous things out there, and we'll talk about them in a bit. But I want to uh, shed some light on neutron stars. So when a star is not um, large enough to grant a black hole after its supernova, um, sometimes it forms a neutron star. So as, as the star is collapsing, as gravity compresses it in uh, when it has stopped radiating um, pressure outwards due to nuclear fusion in the core, um, the star starts to compress. And in these extremely compressed conditions, um, protons and neutrons kind of smack together, or no, protons and electrons rather, kind of smack together and form neutrons. They neutralize their charges and that's we just have this neutron soup. Um, and since there's no uh, magnetic or electromagnetic um, repulsion between the particles, it can get extremely dense. Um, so there's very little space in between these neutrons. Um, and uh, if you were to take a spoonful of neutron star, just, just a regular, like if you were eating cereal, this spoon of neutron star would weigh 10 million tons. So it's this extremely dense material. 
Um, and uh, this leads to some pretty incredible things. Um, sometimes there are small traces of charged particles in these stars like protons and electrons. And when that happens, they generate this um, extremely, extremely powerful magnetic field um, because these neutron stars are rotating extremely violently. So, I mean, if you think about it, this big star is rotating at a fair speed, but then as it compresses, it has to rotate faster and faster. The angular momentum is conserved and it compresses down and it spins faster and faster and faster. Um, and this magnetic field becomes extremely strong due to that rotation and it ejects um, these charged particles out of each end of the magnetic field. And that's what you're seeing now. This is um, a pulsar um, and we call it a pulsar because as this uh, you know, kind of beam gets oriented towards Earth, we see flashes of light in these regular intervals. Um, and uh, some of these pulsars are rotating so fast that their surface is traveling about a fourth of the speed of light, which is kind of insane. Um, and uh, I don't know, that, that's, it's extremely amazing to me. Um, so the next thing we'll talk about are ring galaxies. Um, I also think that these are extremely interesting. Um, and uh, these are galaxies um, where a very high concentration of matter is in this ring, um, kind of separated from the, uh, from the nucleus of the galaxy. Um, and they're formed in a couple known ways, but the two most understood is that um, some galaxies are spinning so fast um, that centripetal forces kind of push the material outwards into this like torus shape. Um, and then out in that torus shape, since it's so dense, um, we get a lot of star formation, um, which is really interesting. Um, and then others like this, uh, that would be um, how one hypothesis of how Hogue's object was formed. Um, and then the Lindsley, Lindsay Staffley ring, I think I'm pronouncing that right, um, was uh, believed to be formed through a galactic collision. So two galaxies kind of interacted and pulled their material into this um, ring outside, and then uh, this material is shot out. Um, and then these kind of waves of material happen. Like when you throw a pebble through water, this material kind of follows that wave that propagates outwards. Um, so again, kind of amazing. Um, and then next, this is actually probably my favorite. Um, these are the voids um, that you can see here. Uh, the, uh, the red text um, denotes the voids. Um, and like I said earlier, um, the universe has this like tendril-like spider web shape of where the galaxies are distributed. Um, and then in between these, uh, these distributions, we have these voids. And there, there's actually very little there. Like the density of material in these areas is extremely, extremely low. Um, the Bootes void, which is right here on the right, um, has a diameter of 330 million light years. So if you were in a car going 60 miles an hour, uh, that would take 3.5 quadrillion years to traverse that. And there would be nothing. Blackness. You would, you would, well, I mean, you'd see stuff from long distances, but there would be nothing to interact with for 3.5 quadrillion years, which is just for reference, 253,000 times the age of the universe. So again, I think that's kind of terrifying, if I can be honest. I feel like there needs to be a Ridley Scott movie made about um, the voids. Um, um, and then we have uh, black holes, and it looks like my uh, picture link got um, uploaded right there. I'm not quite sure what that is. But um, black holes, like I said, probably the coup de gras of uh, the wondrous things that are out there. Um, these things kind of mark the limit of you know what we can understand. Uh, math stops working. Um, physics stops working. Uh, we can't even see them, so that doesn't help. Um, but we can see their outlines, so that's what this image is. This is the um, black hole that was um, kind of the first image that was taken of a black hole here. Um, and this bright orange disk around this, it's kind of in this donut shape um, amid the hole or around the hole in the center is the accretion disk. So this is uh, gas and dust that's um, rotating extremely violently around this black hole in the center and it's heating up due to friction um, with everything and uh, everything colliding with each other and it's radiating a lot of heat that's why it's glowing um, and then at the center we see this shadow of the black hole because any light that gets too close to it gets sucked in and then we can't see it so we really can't see black holes um, we can see the absence of light around a black hole um, as it as it uh swallows all of it and um nothing you know i'm sure you've heard the ubiquitous nothing can escape um and that's just because the energy required to accelerate something enough to escape that gravitational pull 
um, is not available in the universe um, once you get close enough. And also you would have to accelerate to faster than the speed of light, which also um, uh, starts to break everything that we understand. So um, this is kind of the limit of human knowledge. And I think that's why it's so, um, so interesting and so intriguing because it's kind of like the, I like to think of it as like kind of the final boss um, of things to understand. Um, but yeah, so that is the last thing that I have to talk about. So I'm going to hand it over to Lindsay. And Lindsay, if you just want to tell me when you want to head to the next slide, um, you can let me know. We're on the exoplanet slide with the um, brightness diagram. Yeah. So um, one of my favorite things out there in the universe um, are exoplanets. They're planets going around stars that are not our sun, so uh, other solar systems. And the way, or one of the ways that we look for exoplanets around other stars um, is we look at the brightness of the star. So the star's brightness is gonna be pretty constant um, until that planet starts crossing in front of it, blocking out some of the starlight. And you can see a dip in the graph there for the brightness. So something is blocking the light from that star. And so it could be an exoplanet. Um, there's actually some bright stars um, and constellations that you can actually see with your naked eye that have exoplanets. So the first one, um, is in Ursa Major, the Big Bear. Um, so you can see the Big Dipper there. And then if we make it into a bear, the nose of the bear, um, that star is uh, Musida. And there is one confirmed exoplanet around this star and then two others that are probable. Um, the confirmed one is about 2.5 times the mass of Jupiter. Um, it takes about three Earth years to orbit its star. And if it were in our solar system, it would be between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So Musida is a star that you can definitely see with your naked eye. You don't need a telescope. You don't need binoculars or anything like that. Um, but you won't be able to see the planets. You definitely need better technology to be able to see the planets around Musita. But when you do look at the star, you will know that you are looking at an entirely different solar system out there in the universe. Uh, the next one is in Taurus the Bull. So uh, to the left here, we have the famous Orion constellation. Um, and if you connect the three stars of his belt and shoot off into a straight line to the right, you run into the star in Taurus, the bull called Eldebaran. And so this star um, has a, a planet that's about five times the mass of Jupiter, and it orbits about uh, one and a half times farther from its star as our Earth does. Uh, and Eldebaran is about 65 light years away. Uh, the next star that has some planets around it that you can see with your naked eye is Pollux, and Pollux is in the constellation of the Gemini twins. So the two brightest stars in the Gemini constellation are Pollux and Castor, and they're named after um, the twins from the mythologi Greek mythological stories. And so um, Castor and Pollux's mother uh, was Leda, and then their grandfather was Thestius. And the planet that has been found around Pollux is named after his grandfather, it's called Thestius. So this particular planet gets its own special name. Um, they're trying to go around and start giving cool names to exoplanets instead of just having them like numbered and lettered. Um, this particular planet is about twice the mass of Jupiter. Um, orbits about one and a half times away from its star uh, as our Earth. Um, and Pollux is about 34 light years away from us. The next star that you can see with your naked eye that has a solar system is Algebra and it is in Leo the Lion. So if you look kind of to the right of the constellation, you see the backwards question mark um, and the brightest star. Uh, Regulus. Um, so the um, 
one of the stars in the backwards question mark part um, is algebra and it has two planets going around it. Um, algebra is about 130 light years away. Um, the first one, well, actually they're both about two times the mass of Jupiter. Um, one is about two times further from its star as Earth is to the sun. Um, and it orbits around in about one year. And then the other planet orbits in about three years. Uh, the last star um, that you can see uh, up in the night sky that has its own solar system uh, is Kochad, and that's in Ursa Minor, the Little Dipper. Um, and it's actually one of the brighter stars in the Little Dipper. Um, so uh, you don't really need super dark skies to be able to see this star. Um, you can see it's kind of uh, at the end of the cup of the Little Dipper. Um, Kochad has one confirmed planet around it. It's six times the mass of Jupiter, um, and it orbits Kochab at about 1.4 years, um, and is about one and a half times further from its star as our Earth. So again, you won't be able to see these planets with telescopes or anything like that. Um, you would need something um, a lot uh, better, but you can look at these stars and know that you're looking at entirely different solar systems. Awesome, very cool guys. Well, um, so we haven't had any comments, but I'm gonna give people um, a few minutes. If you do have any questions, put them down in the comments. Um, a couple of things I guess I wanna add on. Um, you may have seen that a lot of the planets that Lindsay just told you about are big planets, Jupiter-sized planets. And they are planets that are pretty close to their star. Um, and that is really just a matter of what's easiest to find. right? A bigger planet is going to block more light, so it's more noticeable. Um, also, if it's closer to its star, it's making one orbit in a shorter period of time. And ideally, we want to see kind of three confirmed orbits um, to say that it is actually a planet and not some random variation of the star's light. And so, of course, something that's closer is going to take a shorter amount of time to get that three orbit confirmation. Um, so we have this kind of what we call selection bias when looking for planets, that it's a lot easier for us to find things that are bigger and that are closer to their star. It doesn't mean that that's what's mostly out there. It's just what's easiest for us to find. But we have found planets like um, Earth-sized and at Earth distances, we have found planets that are further out, just not as many because we haven't been doing this for as long. So, yeah. I think it's about 4,000 confirmed exoplanets right now and then 2,000 probable. That sounds about right. I don't know the exact number. Um, all right, well, give people another minute or so if you have questions, and I'll tell you um, our schedule for next week. Um, so Wednesday, we are going to be talking about the solar system. We're going to go on a tour of the solar system, and then we'll also give you some fun activities that you can do at home to explore kind of the size of the planets and the distances between the planets. And then next Saturday, we have um, one of our new shows that we've been working on called Star Wars Fact or Fiction, which is going to look at um, the Star Wars universe and kind of explore what scientific fact and what is mostly made up. Um, this is a show that we are hoping to have in the planetarium not long after we are able to open back up. Um, so it'll be a brand new show that we have once we can open up that um, Eli and Lindsay and some of the other students have been working on. Um, but we want to give you a little bit of a preview of that and kind of um, have some fun talking about Star Wars next Saturday. Um, all right. Well, I'm not seeing any comments. Anyone else have anything you want to say? No? All right, well, 
Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, as usual, any um, live streams you may have missed or you'd like to watch again, you can find them on our YouTube channel. Um, all of that information is in um, our description. Um, and yeah, we will see you next week. Have a great weekend, everyone. So, bye.